Yes, some weather in the southwestern U.S. once again. Welcome to Forecast Lab, a real forecasting channel for real forecasters. No hype and no fluff. And there are some channels out there that really lay on the hype. Well, we take a different approach here. As many of you may know, I was a meteorologist in the Air Force. I really enjoyed that work, but now I am retired. And since then, I create books, video, and software for you all. I still find all this stuff really fascinating, and there's constantly new things to learn. So hopefully I'll be able to convey some of that to you. We'll look at a weather situation exactly as I would have at the forecast counter. So let's begin. Of course, the ideal place to start is with the surface analysis. Typically, we follow the forecast funnel where we look at the large scale details like the hemispheric pattern and drill down to the smaller scales. But this is a little bit more intuitive. I mean, this is showing the weather we have around the US, stormy out west, snow up in Montana and the Dakotas, and a fairly nice day out east. So starting out, yeah, we've got that return flow starting in Texas, but you can see the dew points are on the low side, 40s and 50s. Only around Corpus Christi and Brownsville do we pick up 60s. So this is a very early return flow and not really enough to support severe weather today. We've got the ridging across the eastern U.S., some cool temperatures with that, 40s and 50s. And a little bit further east, we've got the fresh outbreak of cold air moving through the northeastern U.S. That brought some heavy snow to parts of upstate New York and Vermont, over 40 inches around Rutland, Vermont. So we still got quite a bit of cold air, although temperatures are only in the 30s and 40s. And we can see the cold pool aloft. If you look at the dashed lines, those are going to be thickness. And we've got values of about 530 to 525 right in that area. So that's a mid-level and upper-level cold pool. And if you follow that dashed line and look out to the west, you can see thermal ridging right in here. Let me move it so you can get a better look at that. That thermal ridge, and I'm going to draw this out. I'm going to follow that red line. You can see that extending all the way up into Colorado kind of poking up there from old Mexico and all the way into the Dakotas. And that's helping to support these very warm temperatures, 70s in northwestern Kansas and near 70 at Denver. Even up at Rapid City, 61 degrees. But you go a little bit further north and we've got 20s. And that's because we've got shallow northeasterly flow at the surface, temperatures in the 20s around North Dakota. But Obviously, right off the surface with this thermal ridging, we've probably got some overrunning taking place. That's helping to support that precip area out there in Montana. A Pacific front moving through Arizona, showery conditions across much of the state, not really finding much snow, and that's indicative of that warm air in advance of the system, and behind it, 40s and 50s, so a little bit warmer than what we've had over the past couple of weeks. Heading up into Alaska, well, ridging in the Pacific Northwest, but going up there into the Gulf of Alaska, stormy, 990 millibar low south of Anchorage, and some cool temperatures in the interior with low pressure here and high pressure in the Arctic. That gives us a component from north to south and helps keep temperatures on the cool side. So a lot of temperatures below zero. In Canada, similar situation, a polar high from Inuvik down towards, uh, what are those stations? I forgot them already. On the Hudson Bay region, yeah, minus 10, minus 20. And the coldest temperature that I'm seeing here appears to be minus 31 north of Inuvik. And heading back into Canada, weak system up there in Ontario, and a very strong outgoing system in Nova Scotia with some freezing rain from Nova Scotia out towards St. John and the stuff up to the north. It appears to be snow, and you can see most of those temperatures are in the 30s. So we're gradually shifting gears here with the seasons, heading into the second half of March. And we're just going to see warmer and warmer weather over the weeks ahead. 
This is the so-called forecast funnel. We start out with the larger scale picture, and then we go down to the smaller and smaller scales, and that's where we start picking up the essentials of the local forecast. This is the appropriate place to start for today. This is 250 millibars. Since we are going into spring, we do need to transition to the higher levels. During the winter, we used 300 millibars, which is about 30,000 feet. Now we're using 250 millibars up at about 34,000 feet. And as we go into summer, we will end up at 200 millibars, which is about 39,000 feet. So they're all pretty similar but we're trying to resolve that upper part of the troposphere without going too far into the stratosphere. So let's take a look. We've got a long zonal jet from north of Hawaii to just south of Southern California. Another jet coming from Florida out to the central Atlantic and a couple of waves. There's one large wave, another one. These are all medium scale troughs. So we're starting to get a picture of what's going on. We can see the polar vortex way up to the north not particularly strong, centered on the North Pole, about where we expect it, and a couple of segments of it in Baffin Island, the Aleutians, and probably more out towards Russia, but we don't really cover that area. And then we've got these extra tropical lows. There's a couple right there, troughs, and another one out there south of the Aleutians. So we've got a fairly zonal flow and let's take a look real quick and see what happens over the next week or so. And it becomes more meridional. You can see that ridge building in the western U.S., another ridge building in Alaska. And typically when we go meridional, that means a larger variety of interesting weather. And starting out, yeah, there's a very strong jet coming out of the Pacific. When you've got this long flow, long and straight and amplifying patterns, that usually means we're heading into some active weather. So going forward, we can see the jet start moving on to the coast next week, heading into the southwestern U.S. So our focus definitely will be on California once again, all the way down to Texas and maybe over to the central plains. And then next weekend, the 24th, 25th, 26th, well, long wave troughing established out in this area, long wave ridging out east, so that means continued stormy in the western U.S. And out east, mild weather, but it does look like a couple very strong troughs moving through the northeastern U.S. So probably continued quiet in the southeast, but rapidly changeable weather in the northeastern part of the U.S. As we mentioned, we've got full-blown convective storms going up across southern Nevada into the California deserts and over towards Kingman and Prescott. And this whole area is partially dynamically driven. There's some very cold air aloft and strong upper-level winds. You can see those anvils carrying off to the northeast and to the north northeast as well. And that whole area will shift into central Arizona later this evening. You can see that snowpack out there in the Sierra Nevadas. They've had that record snow, but fortunately some clearing in the San Joaquin Valley. Quite a lot to look at on the Las Vegas radar, just numerous showers and storms. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this there. And the northern area of showers and storms over the Sheep Mountains, back towards Pahrump and even over Death Valley. Las Vegas located right there, Mount Charleston, and the Sunrise Mountains right there. Numerous showers and storms down to the south. In fact, the strongest one appears to be right here along Interstate 40 near Needles. And then a look at the radar out of Phoenix. Well, you can see a lot of beam blockage, but in between, yeah, there's some elevated showers moving rapidly from west-southwest to east-northeast, and the rapid motion kind of tells you that it's rooted in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. See them moving along really quickly. That's about a good 40 to 50 miles an hour there. And then we have the 19Z high-resolution rapid refresh up at the top left. Yeah, it does trigger all those thunderstorms. We bring that up to the current time, yeah, that's pretty close to how things look, not precisely how it is. And then we go forward, 
It does seem to be capturing that one cell near Kingman, just to the south of there, and another strong cell indicated just west of Needles. Probably some good storm chasing as far as structure. I would certainly like to be there taking pictures. Then after dark, you can see that heavier stuff moves towards Prescott and some more stuff developing around Phoenix and Phoenix located right in this area here. So it could be a stormy night towards 9 to 10 p.m. So if you're in that area, even east out towards Globe and the Mogollon Rim, definitely want to prepare for possible thunderstorms overnight. Then going into tomorrow morning, we can pick this up with the NAM model. So there's that cluster of storms along and just south of the Mogollon Rim. Heading towards dawn, this complex shifts into western New Mexico. That's going to be associated with that Pacific front. We can see the lower thetas, the lower potential temperatures way out to the west, and the front It's going to be just ahead of this area of westerly flow. It's a very subtle feature, very hard to pick out. However, we go into tomorrow morning, 13Z, that's going to be about 8 p.m. or 8 a.m. Central Time. We lose that shower and storm activity, and it becomes replaced by this Canadian front moving south into the Texas Panhandle. Some separate activity out there in East Texas into the Arklatex. Let me back that up to about dawn. And this is going to be associated with strong warm air advection, just enough instability in the mid-levels to help these elevated cells get going. So it'll be kind of windy and unsettled, cloudy, some showers coming down around Dallas, Waco, Austin. And then we get the afternoon heating. We're up to about 1 p.m. here. The Canadian front continues to surge south, some forced convection developing along that. The dry line, it's not depicted on here, but we can reasonably assume that most of this is dry desert air. So I'm going to put the dry line maybe in here, and I've got a separate set of charts for that. The Pacific front, have no idea. I'm going to guess it's right in there somewhere. The theta field should pick that out, and I think there's probably evidence for a front somewhere. Yeah, probably right in there. As we go into the afternoon, the front moves through Childress, Oklahoma City, and Lubbock. And we start getting some deeper convection developing, possibly around Ardmore, Paul's Valley, Lake Texoma, and some more convection possible in northeast Texas. So around 8 p.m. we get this MCS developing along the front, maybe some strong cells within that. And then going into the overnight hours, just kind of a squeegee squall line moving south. And I'm not really looking for a whole lot of severe weather with that. So at this time, Friday morning, it's cleared most of Texas, bringing cold air southward. The Storm Prediction Center Day 1 Outlook has a marginal risk for today. That's pretty much positioned perfectly right around that heavy stuff south of Kingman. And they've got that tracked down towards Phoenix. So the potential for some heavy cells there. But for tomorrow, we focus on that enhanced risk area from Dallas up towards Ardmore over to Texarkana. And that's going to be where the front impinges on the moisture, which is kind of streaming north during the time of peak heating. And you just saw the timing of everything in that last set of charts, the NEM. And then by the time we get into the overnight hours, it's going to be running through about right here. And that just appears to warrant that slight risk. But the enhanced risk, let's take a look at the severe hazards. Uh, let's see. That's going to be damaging hail, a tornado or two, mostly prior to zero Z. And then it should start lining out somewhat some possibility for bow echoes and then they've got this other area out ahead of the front that's that other area i was pointing at around mount pleasant texarkana earlier during the afternoon and those are more isolated those could have potential for a few supercells and some of you may find this chart interesting this is one kilometer winds moisture and wind speed so the wind speed that's going to be this shading at the very top left. 
that shading right there indicating the low level jet trying to get established this is going to be current so we're starting to get that strong return flow setting up you can see the streamlines indicating that and the green marks those are going to be temperatures at one kilometer in celsius so up to eight celsius which is 46 degrees fahrenheit the value to keep in mind is 10 10 degrees celsius that's always going to be 50 and if you want to throw in another one 15 that's going to be about 59 so going through the overnight hours what we're watching for is the possibility of a low level jet starting out we've got 25 knots there at fort worth 30 at abilene and then going into the overnight hours yeah the jet does strengthen over oklahoma 60 knots there around enid up to wichita and it kind of sits there along that axis from about fort worth to chanute kansas looking at about 50 to 60 knots and then the 12z soundings should reflect this pattern right here so a moderate low level jet in place it is somewhat veered though which is not all that big of a problem if your low level flow at the surface is out of the east or the southeast because then you get that directional turning in other words as you go aloft from the surface the winds shift from east southeast to southeast to south and then over to southwest and that's a lot of turning there in the lowest one kilometer so really it all depends on what the surface winds are doing if the surface winds are similar then you're not going to really have that shear so going into the daytime yeah things become a little bit more veered and the low level jet weekends which typically does happen during the afternoon and then we've got that cold front coming south out of the central plains and that's how things look in the evening so still some strong flow over northeast texas although the better winds have shifted up into illinois which are is not going to really help severe weather all that much that's pretty far north and if you want to look at the moisture yep there's a chart that i've got for you here this is going to be 50 degrees Fahrenheit at one kilometer, and you can see the moisture trying to pour in during the morning. So that's going to be 12Z. That's tomorrow about dawn. And a lot of it does remain in place into the afternoon. So yeah, moisture is going to be somewhat in place right there in east and northeast Texas. And the moisture axis impinges on the front right around Paris, Texas. So that is going to have probably the best potential for severe weather. And then things start lining out at this point, the front just hitting this wall of moisture, and we're just going to get a lot of cell competition, which means a big MCS. And that's about all we can cover for today. For some reason, we're behind schedule. I think daylight savings time is a big reason for that. It's kind of really messed up my routine. Also, my mother-in-law is in the hospital for heart failure. She got COVID back in January and her cardiovascular health really got a lot worse quick. And at her age, she's near 80 years old and that's not good at all. So we're having to take care of her and take care of the family and all that. So I'm gonna go and get this wrapped up and hopefully we'll see you back here again on Friday. Hope you all have a great rest of your Wednesday evening, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.